Please turn to page 232 for stage seven, writing an opinion about narrative text. On page 232 is the opinion chant. When you first begin this lesson, you always wanna start with the chant so that you're introducing what the students will be writing about. I, the writer, give my opinion about the text, and then I call in the team to back me up. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to write an opinion, and we're gonna call in the team so the team can back us up. On page 233, you will see a black line master for the students to fill in for this stage seven lesson. You don't need to give them a black line master. You could just ask them to write so team on a blank sheet of paper or on notebook paper. It really doesn't matter, whichever works best for you. I like just using blank paper or notebook paper because it's fast and quick and the students are responsible for organizing their information on their own instead of waiting for you to give them an organizer. In my scope and sequence, I had mentioned that you had the students orally rehearse and say an opinion. The first couple of lessons, don't even fill in an organizer. Just orally walk through these steps and have the kids say the opinion. After they understand what S-O-T-E-A-M means, and they understand the process of how you get that information, then you can hand them an organizer and they can start filling this in. First, this organizer may just be a visual for them to see. We are going to form an opinion and back it up using so team. The S is summary, the O is opinion, the T is transition, the E is evidence, the A is analyze the evidence, and the M is make it matter. Let's start our lesson by going to the next page and looking at your checklist and a completed organizer and published piece of writing. On page 234 at the top is a checklist for stage seven, two paragraph writing about a text. And like all of my checklists, you have content and organization, sentences, and mechanics. This checklist is designed specifically for two paragraph opinions about a text, whether it's literature or informational text. Down below is our sample of the completed organizer for narrative text, as well as the published piece of writing. On the facing page, you will see that I have a sample organizer and published writing for informational text. Our next video will be about writing an opinion about informational text. In this video, we are focusing on the narrative text. On the sample organizer, you go to the S, the summary, is that I'm using Joseph Bruchock's short story, A Boy Called Slow. This activity can be done with any type of narrative text, drama, or poetry. If you're reading novels, you may want to write an opinion about every five chapters in a novel. It's really just that you're giving an opinion about a piece of literature that you are reading. In this case, the students had read A Boy Called Slow and they know the story. You can't write an opinion unless you know the story. We had already finished reading it. They had summarized the story. They know what the story is about. The next process is for the children to have an opinion. So you go from the know it, I know the story, to the next level of I'm going to evaluate the story. I'm going to have an opinion about the story. We summarize that story and then notice on the next part of this organizer for the O, the opinion says theme fairness. Because our opinion is about a theme in this story, we're going to turn to the next two pages and I'm gonna walk you through the process to teach children what a theme is. Why am I doing that? because so many opinions at your grade levels will be about the theme of a story, the theme of the text. And for children to give an opinion, evaluate a text and say what they think the theme of the text is or one of the themes in the text, that's very difficult because a theme is a very high level, high thinking type of activity. So I'm gonna show you a way in which I teach children themes so that eventually they can identify them independently in any type of text. Let's go to the next page. We will walk through the process of how to teach a theme. Once the children have that theme down, then I will go through the steps for you to do so team. On page 236, you see I have six circles here. This is a process I use called my theme circles in which I teach my children what a theme is. Now, when we talk about a theme, a theme is the author's message 
It is what the author is trying to tell you through this story, through this piece of literature, some sort of message about humankind. So what I like to do is I like to draw a person on the world and say to the children, boys and girls, we're going to learn what themes are. And themes are something that all people, and then I put a person on top of the world and I draw the world and I tell them whether they lived long ago, today or in the future or anywhere on the planet Earth, these are things that people have in common with each other. These are called themes. This is when an author writes a story, you may have never had any experiences that this author is talking about, but it's the theme pulls us in. It's what we all have in common with each other. And these messages that an author has could tell us good things that people have in common and bad things that we have in common. Let me show you what I mean. Long ago, today, or in the future, let's take a theme. Kindness, long ago, were there people who showed kindness? And anywhere on the earth, did they show kindness? Yes. Today, will there, are there people anywhere on the earth that show kindness? Yes. And in the future, are there people that will show kindness? Yes. That's a theme. That's a message about how all humankind have things in common with each other, these universal themes. So that would be kindness. And I could do the same thing with love, with compassion, what about a bad theme? Greediness, long ago was there greediness? Yes, today, in the future, yes. Then greediness is a theme and we would record that on our chart. And when an author writes a story, characters are doing things in the story and all the events of the story that reveal a theme. At that point, once I explain what themes are and how characters through their actions in the story reveal a theme, then I'm ready to say, boys and girls, I'm going to teach you one of the themes that will be in our story. When I say one of the themes, it's because stories many times have multiple themes. Characters' actions in a story reveal the theme. And as you go through a story, they will act differently and different themes will reveal themselves. Once I introduce what a theme is, then I need to introduce specific themes to students. On your page, you'll see the word fairness. There were many themes in A Boy Called Slow. One of the themes that I noticed in the story when I had read it before even teaching the lesson was fairness. So I'm going to teach that before the story. Now later in the year, once my students have a bank of themes, I don't need to teach a theme before the story. The reason why I teach it before the story is because when I finish reading a story and I ask the children, what themes do you think the author revealed through this story? The children don't have enough experiences to be able to pull out themes. So they just look and guess and they don't know what you're talking about. We need to teach many themes ahead of time so that they develop a bank. So whenever they read a story, they now have a bank of themes in order to identify them in other stories. I fill in the top three circles before we read the story. After the story is over, we go back and we connect the theme, and in this case, fairness, to that specific story. So let's get started. Before we read A Boy Called Slow, I'll say to the boys and girls, one of the themes that I want you to notice in the story is fairness. And then I have the students say, what is fairness? Thank you for asking. Here's our three theme circles. What's the first circle? The first circle is always going to be someone. So we always have someone in that first circle. Why? Because stories have characters who go through the action in the story. Let's go to the second circle. What's the second circle? The second circle is going to be their action. So some sort of an action. What's the third circle? The third circle is going to be the effect or why they do that action. So in order to understand a theme, we're going to connect that to how stories work. And in this case, we're focusing on the theme fairness. And to understand fairness at a deep level, we're using our theme circles. So what is fairness? Fairness is, and we're gonna put a finger out so that we can act it out, someone. So we're gonna pretend like that's someone. So someone, and what actions are they going to do? They are going to get all the facts. Why are they doing that? Before they make a decision. So what is fairness? Someone is getting all the facts before they make a decision. What do I mean by getting all the facts? Well, 
They're going to listen and observe, and they're also taking in different points of view. They're listening to everybody's point of view. What is fairness so far? Fairness is someone is getting all the facts by listening, observing, and taking in everybody's point of view. And let's go to our last circle, in order to make a decision. And in order to be fair, that decision is made without favoritism. I'm not favoring one person over the other. I'm just trying to collect the facts. I'm listening, I'm observing, I'm taking in everybody's point of view so I can make a decision without showing favoritism so I can seek the truth. That's what I mean by fairness. Fairness is someone collects all the facts by listening, observing, and taking in all different points of view. A decision can be made without favoritism and in order to seek the truth. We have our definition of favoritism. I've said that to the students. They chant that back and forth. Then when we go to read the story, they're looking for any people who had these actions for this reason. Notice what I'm doing. I'm not telling them what happened in the story. I'm explaining to the students what fairness actually means at a deep, sophisticated level. When they read the story, they can identify that. That's before the story. After we finish reading the story, so these are our after circles, we're going to come back to this definition that we had about fairness. Let's look at our first circle. We're looking at the someone circle. Who was fair in the story? It was the adults in the tribe, the people of the tribe. What did they do? How did they collect facts? What were they listing, observing, looking at different points of view? What were they doing to be fair? They were watching and listening to the youngsters in their tribe. They would watch the children, they would listen to the children, so they're collecting those facts. They're not making any decisions until they collect the facts, and then once they collect the facts, they give a name that reflects the actions, the things the children do and say, so that their names match who they are. That is what happened in A Boy Called Slow that showed fairness from the people in their tribe. There's our theme circles. That's what I do before the story and after the story. Once the story is over, we have our theme and notice we have our deep thinking so that we can analyze where in the story the characters revealed that theme. After you've done all this work and you show children what a theme is, you don't want these theme circles to disappear. Go to page 237. On page 237, you will see you could have a wall chart. What you do is you can put the theme up with the story and then you have the theme circles there. I just have the three theme circles, the top ones, the generalized theme circles. Then I put a picture of whatever story we use to show that theme. So notice on this top theme here it said perseverance and then it used the story Akiak to show perseverance. If I was reading another story, like let's say Lou Gehrig, I may draw Lou Gehrig here and write the title of the story. What you will find is as you go through your different stories, themes keep repeating themselves and you could keep adding titles to the different themes that you have up on your board. But you wanna keep those definition circles, those theme circles up there so that when students read other stories, they can look up at this theme wall as a reminder of different themes they know and decide, do I see any of those themes in the story? As the year goes on, you don't need to give them themes any longer before they start reading a story. Once you have a wall chart up that has maybe 10 to 15 themes on it, you're done. That's fine. You're, you have plenty of themes up there because like I said, they keep repeating themselves over and over again. This is more of a first half of the year activity where you build this theme wall. After the wall has many themes on it, you don't need to start your stories with that ahead of time. Now let's look right next to it. I have another chart here. This is for character traits. Character traits are just like themes. You could have the theme of the story is perseverance, but you could also have a character trait chart which shows a character who had perseverance. So themes and traits are really the same thing, except a theme is talking about the entire story or a part of the story. 
while the traits are talking about a specific character. The moral is usually stated in a sentence or a few sentences. For instance, one of the themes was perseverance in the story. One of the char character's traits is perseverance. Or the moral of the story is try, 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 and never give up until you reach your goal. Notice themes, traits, and morals really are the same thing. It's just, what are you looking at? Are you looking at a lesson through the moral, a theme, the universal message of the author, or a trait, a specific character? Now, one last thing, if you turn to the next page, this is just a resource that you can use that lists many character traits, that lists the impact of a setting if you were doing mood or themes and morals. So again, it's just another list for you to use that you could have as a reference in order to help students form their opinions to their story. At this point, we went through the process of we're reading A Boy Called Slow. Before we read the story, I gave my students the three theme circles in which I wanted to teach them one of the themes that was in the story, and that's fairness. I gave them that definition of fairness. We read the story. After we read the story, we went back and we used the bottom three circles to specifically identify where fairness was in the story of Boy Called Slow. I'm teaching an opinion to the students, we always will go, oh, I have an opinion. One of the themes of the story was fairness. And then we all go, back it up, back it up, back it up. All right, let's go to our books and find where characters showed fairness in the story. Where was that revealed? And then we flip through and we find different places in the story where evidence was revealed. We are doing that oral rehearsal. And then when we come to actually filling it in, we can, we know where that evidence is. On page 239, we will begin our lesson of filling in our so team. We finished reading the story. I tell the boys and girls, boys and girls, we know this story a boy called slow. What are we going to do now? I, the writer, am going to tell my opinion about the text and call in the team to back me up. That's right. We are going to fill in our so team so that we can have an opinion about the text. And our S is where we're going to start first. And the S is for summary. Why do we have the summary of the story? We can't just finish a story and say, oh, I think one of the themes was fairness. Because what if someone hadn't read the story? What if you just walked up to someone, like you went home and you saw your mom and said, oh yeah, hi mom, yeah, you know, I think that theme was fairness. They don't even know what you're talking about. And remember, we're going to be writing these opinions. So someone may pick up our opinion and they don't know what you're talking about. So you can't start off with saying, I think the theme was, was fairness. That doesn't even make sense. That's not being polite. So what do we need to do when we first start writing our opinion about a story? We need to give a quick summary, be polite. That's right, we need to be polite to our reader. Our reader doesn't know what we're talking about. We have to tell them that. When we are giving an opinion, we always start off with the summary. We give a quick summary because we need to be polite to our reader. What does our quick summary need? Down below, you're going to see, and this will be in our tools section. So at the end of this whole chapter, you will find all the tools that I will show you. Here we have our be polite, summarize the text. And this is a little frame where it shows, here's the author's name, here's the title, this book is mostly about, here's the main character, and then here's the gist of the story. When I write a quick summary, I'm not telling the whole story, what do I need to give? I need to give the author, I need to tell the title, I need to tell the main character, and the gist of the story, the basic plot of the story. That's what a quick summary is, so that someone knows what you're talking about before you give your opinion. So how do I do that? I can take out my little template here. Now remember at the beginning of the year, I told you that before you even fill in an organizer, you can do oral rehearsals of these opinions. When you finish reading any story, you could take this template and just say, who's our author? What's the title? This book is mostly about, who's our main character? What's the gist of the story? and you can orally rehearse a quick summary about anything that you've read. Let's walk through how I'd use this for A Boy Called Slow. At this point, I'm going to take out my template. I'll show it up on the document viewer. 
The students will have their so team there, and we're just going to record this information in our box. Notice I'm not writing out the quick summary. I'm using keywords or simple icons, drawings, in order to fill in the information I need for my quick summary. This is my brainstorm, not my finished piece of writing. I go to the first part. Boys and girls, who's the author? Joseph Bruchock. Okay, write it down. Make sure we capitalize Y. It's a name, it's a proper noun. That's right. Wrote, what do we have? A boy called slow. Now, a boy called slow is the title. What do we do in a title? Capitalize the first word and all the important words in a title. That's right. A, is that an important word? No, but it's the first word. Capitalize it. Boy, yes, it's an important word. Capitalize it. Called, is that an important word? Yes, capitalize it. Slow, capitalize it. So what do we do in a title? We capitalize the first word and all the important words in a title. After we do that, we have to decide, are we going to underline it or are we going to put quotation marks around it? Let's see. A Boy Called Slow is a short story. It's part of a big anthology. So there were many short stories in this one big book. It's almost like the book is hugging it. It's small, so it needs a hug. While if it were a novel, like let's say Charlotte's Web, it stands on its own because it's a novel. It's one thing. It's not a part of something else. It stands on its own. Well, A Boy Called Slow, was that standing on its own or was it part of something? It was part of something. So what does it need? It needs a hug. That's right, because it was part of something. It's almost like the anthology is hugging it. So what do we do? We put quotation marks around it. What are quotation marks? They're almost like a hug. What do you do when you have something that can stand on its own? Underline it, because it's standing on its own. All right, so we go to a boy called slow, and what are we gonna do? Put our quotation marks around it. After we have the author and the title, and we wrote that down, then I go over to this book is mostly about who is our main character in this story. And then we said Sitting Bull. This was about the Native American Sitting Bull. What do I need to do when I'm writing down Sitting Bull? Capitalize it. Why? Because it's a proper noun, his name. So we write down sitting bull. We're going to go to the last part, and that's the X here. That means the problem in the story, the main event. When I say the gist of the story, I could mean the main event, the problem, or the conflict, or some sort of quest that the character was going on. Now that's one way I could do this. I could say the story was about Sitting Bull. What problem was Sitting Bull facing in the story? What event was this story mostly about? Or what quest was Sitting Bull going on in this story? That still is difficult for students. When they're trying to get the gist of the story, it is difficult to even go here for them to identify that. Many kids have a tough time with this. So let me show you a little trick. When you have a character in story, what's driving their action is a want or a need. So I like to use that, wants or needs. In the story, what does Sitting Bull want? What does Sitting Bull need? Then what I have the students do is they all talk to each other. So in the story, Sitting Bull wants something or he needs something. What does he want? What does he need? And they all talk to each other. And it is amazing how those two words, and you choose the one that makes more sense, and in this case, it would be wants, it, it, it makes so much more sense to students to find the gist of the story by using these words. So they are talking to each other and they say, he wants to have a name that shows that he's a brave warrior. When we started reading the story, what was he called in the story? Slow, because everything he did when he was a little boy, what he did slow, methodically. So what did his tribe do? They observed him and then they said, we're gonna call him slow. And what did Sitting Bull want in the story? This is about how he wants a name that reflects that he's a brave warrior. Here we have the summary of our story. Joseph Bourjac wrote A Boy Called Slow. This book is mostly about Sitting Bull as a young boy and how he wants to have a name that shows he's a brave warrior. We orally rehearse that. We have our summary, be polite. We've got it. Next, what do we need? We need our opinion. On page 240, what you will see is who or what do we have an opinion about? The theme. And then what's our opinion? Fairness. Bottom of each one of these pages as I'm filling in the chart are all of my helper sheets. These are how to start an opinion. 
What phrases could I use to start an opinion? Notice I have just in my opinion, I think, I believe, without a doubt. To my mind, I would say that. It strikes me that. I have all these different ways that students could begin their opinion. If they want to, they could record how they're going to start that up here, or they could just have that where they say it in their oral rehearsal. Remember, these are quick notes that you're recording for your opinion. Also displayed here is my opinion sheet. First, you're just stating who or what is your opinion about. We know it's about a text. We're going to have it, though, about the theme in a the text. And then, what's my opinion? It's going to be fairness. At this point, we have quick summary, be polite, tell your opinion. Next, I need to call in the team to back me up. I need to back up my opinion. I can't just give my opinion. I have to back it up. All right, so let's go to the next page and look at how we back it up. First, we need to start with T and team. On page 241, we're going to focus on how to write a transition. I have a transition sheet below. And this helper sheet is going to make your transitions much more sophisticated. So many times when we look at transitions, students saying things like, the first reason why I think the theme is fairness, mm, that's fine. But I'm going to show you something that's a little bit more sophisticated when you're dealing with literature. Your transition can have three parts to it. So you put three lines there. The first line is going to be, where in this text is your evidence for this opinion? Is it in the beginning, middle, or the end? The next line is going to be what, and then I'm gonna put like a little stick figure here with a pencil, because that's going to be the author. What did the author use to reveal this opinion? Did the author use dialogue, thoughts, actions, and then we'll put a little squiggly line like this, or descriptions in order to reveal, and then our last line, whatever the opinion is. We have, in the beginning of the story, the author used dialogue and actions in order to reveal fairness. You're looking at a way to teach children a transition where it's going to add so much more sophistication to their opinions, as well as direct the reader to where in the story you are getting your evidence. Down below, I have a little helper chart. And on this chart, it shows a sample of how I did the Here's your beginning, middle, end. Here's the author's tools. And then here was where we repeated the opinion. Down below are different ways that you can form each part of this frame. Here's the beginning, middle, end phrases. Here in the middle are phrases you can use for the author's tools. Here's different ways that you can begin how you repeat the opinion. This is a very valuable tool that will immediately add sophistication to your students' opinions. On page 242, we will focus on our evidence. In order to write the transition, we already have to have found the, the evidence. You first have the students say, I think the theme of the story is fairness. And then we all go, back it up, back it up, back it up. Let's say it was on page 25, paragraph two. We read that paragraph and we have to decide what kind of evidence are we recording? Are we going to paraphrase it or is it going to be a direct quote? So this is what I say to the kids. When we read something, we have to decide, are we going to have a direct quote, use the author's exact words, or paraphrase it, say it in our own words? How do we record the information? How do we decide whether to use a direct quote or paraphrase? I just give a simple formula of, if it's two short sentences or it could be one long sentence, then use a direct quote. But if you have more than two sentences, then think about paraphrasing. In this case, we were reading many sentences. So what did we have to do? We had to paraphrase, say it in our own words. That's difficult because what happens is, is the kids then just repeat everything they've read. We read a passage just now that showed fairness. How am I going to paraphrase that information? We're going to use two lines. One is going to have a C under it. The other one is going to have an arrow. What's the C for? The C is for character who, and we're going to say it just like this, character, who showed fairness. So from what we just read, this passage we read, who showed fairness. Then the second line is arrow. What did those characters or that character do that showed fairness? That will only pull out the information that you need. 
regarding evidence that shows fairness. So we went and we drew two lines. C is character. Who is showing fairness? The people in the tribe. Action. What did the tribe do in this passage? They would watch the children in their tribe before giving them their name. So notice I'm only saying what we read about. I am only going into the text and saying what the text gives me. And I'm putting that down. And notice I can use icons, keywords to put down my information. We have the tribe. What do they do? They would observe the children before giving them their name. Down below, let's look at our helper sheets also in order to get evidence. This evidence sheet right here is something that you could do where you say, okay, what was our opinion? Fairness. Here's your C, here's your arrow. Form evidence into a sentence. Who showed fairness? The tribe. What did they do? They would only observe the children before giving them their name. This sheet right here is a visual that is walking through the process that I went through to show children how to paraphrase. Also, below it is another box. Can you tell more about the evidence? I'm expanding. Maybe I have more information I could pull from the text that tells us about what the tribe does. This is just a helper sheet that will walk your students through what we just did here, C arrow. Also, I have my transition sheet. Notice my transition sheets. Here's transitions for opinions. Your E for evidence when you're paraphrasing. We could use one of these transitions. To begin, the people in the tribe would observe their children before naming them. So maybe we would start with to begin. Or in the beginning of the story, or to start, the tribe would observe their children before naming them. If you're using a quote, then you can use a key selection of the text that backs up my opinion is, you put that direct quote. Here's our transitions for analysis and make it matter also. This transition sheet is something that you can use for all the parts of So Team. Let's go to the next page where we're going to analyze the evidence. On page 243 is our analysis. An analysis is when you are going to analyze the evidence explain why the evidence proves or backs up that the theme is fairness. So our analysis is the students having to think at a high level to explain how that evidence proves fairness. That is a very difficult task for many students. And we need to have a way to concretely show them how to think and how to analyze the text. What I do is I use opposite boxes. I have the students draw two boxes on their page. And what the opposite boxes do is when you are talking about a theme, a character, a character trait, a moral of the story, many times what you're doing when you're analyzing is you're showing how something is special, different from what is typical. So that's your thinking that you're using to analyze your evidence when you're dealing with, in this case, a theme. I would draw a box here and a box here. These top two boxes here are going to be the first box. So they're dealing with this box. This bottom section on my helper sheet is going to deal with the second box. Notice I have a bunch of transition words here. So you're choosing one of these words in order to put on top of the box. And I chose the word most. Then you have the bottom box here that has starter words and I chose the word however. Let's go to our first box. In our world as we know it, what do most people do in our world when it comes to naming their children? Most people will name their children when they're born. They are not looking at the traits of their kids. They're not looking at what their child is like. They give them a name. Let's go to the other box and let's look at what did the tribe do? However, Lowe's tribe wants to seek the truth. So they observe the children in their tribe because they want the truth, they want the name, truly reflect the child's actions and the things they say. That is our opposite box. What do most people do? What do you find that most often happens? And then what's special here? What makes this different? That's how we analyze this with our opposite box. We have our summary, our opinion, transition, evidence, and there's our analysis using the opposite box. Let's go to the final box, and that's the M, make it matter. On page 244, we will end our team with 
make it matter. This is where we're going to take this analysis of what Slow's tribe did and we're going to make it matter. We're going to connect it back to the real world. We're going to make sense of this. This is what a good reader does. They're analyzing text, they're giving an opinion about things, they're explaining why they have that opinion, and then they make it matter by connecting it back to the world. How am I going to use this in the world? And I have a helper sheet here for Make It Matter. I have three categories that you could go to to connect this back to make it matter, to make this analysis of the text matter. First, I could make my analysis matter by understanding people's behavior in the world. So now I can take that and understand how people behave or how I could behave differently in the world using what I read in the story. Or I could have an emotional reaction. I could show how what I read, this evidence, this analysis, how this could cause people to be upset, happy, have hope, some sort of an emotion. Or what I read could make me think of new ideas. I could think of something new in the world, some sort of message that this is revealing to me. So I have people's behaviors, I have an emotion, or I have something that's universal about the world that this makes me think about. In this case, when I'm seeing the actions of the people, we went to, you know what, this could teach us about people's behaviors, about how we act, how we behave. Let's use that. Let's go to this column. And then I have a bunch of different frames that you could use. You don't need to use this, but this is a great way to help students try to form some sort of statement. So we're taking how this tribe was trying to seek the truth about someone, about their children, by naming them in the way that they act. So we're going to now make this matter by using the people's behaviors. And we're going to use the if then phrase. If you want to seek the truth about people, then you may want to learn how the Sioux treated their people. You may want to use the same actions that the Sioux did where they observed before they named someone. If you want to treat people fairly, then you may want to follow the steps of the Sioux. On the facing page is a finished completed organizer as well as the two paragraph opinion writing. S and the O is paragraph one and the team is paragraph two. You orally rehearse this opinion over and over and then you write it out. Because you can see there are so many elements to fill in for an opinion you want the children to learn what so team is before you ever have them start writing out and filling in an organizer. I showed you how to fill in the organizer, but let me show you quickly what you would do just for an oral rehearsal, oral practice where you would not fill anything in, you would just do this orally. So let's use this same process that I walked through. You just finished reading the story, a boy called slow, and you say to the you say to your boys and girls, boys and girls, I have an opinion. The theme is Fairness, and then the kids go, quick summary, be polite. Oh, sorry, Joseph Bruchock wrote the short story called Slow. This story is mostly about when Sitting Bull was a young Native American boy and he wants a name that shows he's a brave warrior. There's my summary. Now I'll tell my opinion. I think one of the themes of the story is fairness. Once I have my opinion and I say what my opinion is, I have the entire class go like this. Back it up, back it up, back it up. Oh, okay, I can't just have an opinion. I have to back it up. So what am I gonna do? Call in the team to back me up. Let's go to my team, transition. Boys and girls, open up your book. I'm going to use my three lines to show you what my transition is. In the beginning of the story, so please turn to page 25. In the beginning of the story, the author used dialogue and actions to reveal the theme fairness. I have my transition. I have my transition into the book. I told you to go to page 25 and then I used my transition. In the beginning of the story, the author used dialogue and actions to show fairness. Let's read that dialogue and actions. That's paragraph two. So we read the whole paragraph. I just read my evidence. What am I gonna do? Direct quote or paraphrase it? I'm going to paraphrase it. Let me use my two lines. Character, who showed fairness? The tribe. Action, what do they do to show fairness? They would watch their children before naming them. Excellent. So there's my evidence. Back it up, back it up. There's my evidence. So I'm just saying this to the kids. 
Then after I do that, I have all the kids put their hands on their hips and they go, what does that mean? And they point to my evidence. How does that evidence prove the theme is fairness? Oh, I can't just say, oh, here's the evidence, I'm done. I have to explain it. So then I show my two opposite boxes. And I put two boxes up on the board and I go, most people would just name their kids right when they're born. They're not looking at what their kids are like, their personalities, nothing. But the Sioux would watch and listen to their children and name them according to their actions and the things they would say. So that they would truly collect all the facts and name them according to their actions and the things they would say. Next, I have the kids go, make it matter, make it matter. Oh, so I need to make this matter. Who cares that I'm analyzing this story and they do that? Unless I can make it matter, I need to connect it back to the world. So let's see, how can I make it matter? Oh, let's make it matter by looking at how this can teach me how I can behave differently. So let's see, I could either make it matter by teaching me or showing people how we could behave differently. I could make it matter by just showing how I feel about this. This is making me have an emotional reaction. Or I can make this matter to reveal a new idea about the world. If I want to be more of a fair person, then I should try to act more like the Sioux. Excellent job. So I have that make it matter. This teaches them as we're walking through orally the opinion, what the team means and what they're supposed to be thinking. Once I orally give my opinion and I walk through the team, then I say to them, go through the story and find more places in the story that revealed fairness. So the students in their table groups are working together to find other places that showed fairness. Once a group finds something, I'm walking around helping the kids, then I stop the whole class. Everyone stop. And I have that entire table group start off with, we have an opinion. And then the whole class goes, quick summary, be polite. So then they say their quick summary. And then they say, one of the themes was fairness. And then the whole class says to that table group, back it up, back it up, back up your opinion. Oh, and then they tell the whole class, please turn to page 35 and go to paragraph two. And they read paragraph two, and then they say, ah, this is in the middle of the story, so let's make our transition. After we read our evidence, we go transition. In the middle of the story, the author used the dialogue to show, show the theme fairness. Excellent. Now let's look at what we just read, your evidence. Who showed fairness? What do they do to show fairness? And then they're stating that evidence. Next, we do the opposite boxes, and we go, shh. How does that evidence show fairness? And then the kids are using the opposite boxes and saying it. And then the whole class says, make it matter, make it matter. And then they do a make it matter. And you can have another group find more evidence and we walk through that again. That oral language practice where you're just making this a fast, quick, back it up, back it up, back it up. And that's what I call the oral rehearsal one. Let's do a back it up. Let's make an opinion and back it up. We want that under, our, under control. We want kids to orally be able to say, so team, with ease, before we actually give them an organizer and start including the organizer to record their ideas on it and then take it to writing. So the beginning of the year, you may use the first two or three stories where you just do an oral rehearsal of so team. After the students can orally rehearse it and say the so team, then you can introduce the organizer. This is our stage seven two paragraphs writing an opinion about narrative text. In our next video, I will walk you through the steps to write a two paragraph opinion at stage seven, but for informational text.